I'll show you this before we lose sight of it. You see that tree in the skyline, Chris? Yeah. If you look up above it, there's a wee speak of a branch sticking up. Yeah. Can you see the, the pathway, the trackway coming back down to the right? Yes. Now that track angles all the way right down through here, right down to the village. And that was a track to take the cows out to the shielings. The shielings. So we've got shielings there. We've got a lot of shielings out there where we're going to go to. There's about 25 shielings all supplying grub to this claim. Bob Lear is a lost township, tucked away in the trees, just a stone's throw from the road between Allapool and Inverness at Inverlaw. Centuries of history lie buried and forgotten. In this series, with the help of Allapool Museum, archaeologists and historical experts, we're bringing the people and stories of Balblair and Inverlaw back to life. Eight snapshots, reimagine moments in Highland history, which have, until recently, been hidden in plain sight. Episode 2, The Sheeling. Fed me of an Fed me of an I'm Dr Elizabeth Ritchie and I work for the Centre for History at the University of the Highlands and Islands. A shilling and an ari are the same thing. Ari is simply the Gaelic word. Um, for a shilling. A shilling is a piece of ground that's up on the hills or out on the moorland and it's used for seasonal grazing. Transhumans is the technical term where you take your animals to a particular location. It happens all over the world, in the Alps for example, for grazing in the summer and it keeps the animals away from the growing crops and allows them to take advantage of the grass that is growing on the hills or out in the moorland. Once the grass came through in about May, mid-May, they would move the whole outfit up to rest the ground down here. Then the men and the, the elderly boys got stuck into um, ploughing, sowing with oxen, getting the, the thing fertile again. And the kids and the women up there with the cows. So they stayed up there right through till October, till the weather broke. It's me for to come here. Och ein chaniel kaina mer ne fachklan. Chod am ein hor an et plian ich an eras. Chaniel usu kam chojnchen koju. Ko chan ich nach purain doch halak pisan bak a bar doch a chirir toile hein. Ach Johnny, I can't mind the words. It was a song I heard years ago. You can't hear me anyway. Who says the lassie couldn't make up her own wee poems? Sad am I up here without you. The ceiling bright and bonny, springtime makes all anew, but I'm pining for my Johnny. So it's this kind of circular system of grazing and making sure that the land is useful and is sustainable, but also the grazing pastures for the cattle is useful and sustainable. And this kind of circular pattern seems to be a really good economic way to be able to sustain arable and cattle farming at the same time. I'm Siobhan Beetson. I am the curator at Alpool Museum. I am leading the research team for the Lost Envelope project. The life in the shillings is such an important part of their life. They're up there for months. The dynamics, the jobs, the tasks that need to be doing, the expectations at the time are one third of their entire yearly cycle of their life. So by understanding just how they work, how they socialise with each other, I think it gives us a lot of information that we can then put in context with the rest of their lives when they're down in the normal settlement. People would have been living in stone buildings. See, that's a shielding there. You know, there's a, there's a stonework there. You can just make it out there, Chris. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were small. You'd be sleeping in them. You might be on the bad days doing your work in them, but a lot of the work, I think, would have been done outside. And there's also buildings there for storing all of the cheese and butter and milk and so on that, that you're, you're producing. The work is fine, though we toil from creaker day to the gloaming. And all the time I sing my own song, private to myself. The sweet scent of the gorse, 
and the spice of the crowdy. The cuckoo's song in the morn, the melody of child's play. <laughs> I don't think I'll be a famous bard. So shall we dairy safe here? That's the size of them. It's usually a metre by metre and a half. And quite often they were corbelled, trying to keep it as cool as possible. I think the people we tend to have up there are older children, ones who are old enough to be useful <laughs> and not just needing to be looked after, and mainly younger women. So we're maybe talking about women in their teens and in their 20s. I strongly suspect that by the time a woman was married and had her first child, she's probably going to be staying down in the winter town looking after uh, the wee ones. So you've mainly got older children and younger women. Since a bairn, I've loved these times. A wee bit of freedom from father and the drich and tidy some work. Breathing the fresh air away from Balablair. But now, ach, Johnny, I long for you. Ji hawde sy'n dras dy y gael? Y cadw chi'n yn teian? What are you at right now, my love, mending the begins? Are you thinking at all of me, Johnny boy? Have you a wee song or verse on your lips? There will be some men up there, but the this point, the men are more likely to be out fishing. They will come back and they might come home and visit, but the women and children and maybe a couple of the young men to help corral any cat, stray cattle would be the main residents who were up in the Shielands at that time. My Johnny, you are the darling of all the lasses round, whilst there at the lambing dreams of you abound. But take no heed of them, lad, listen only now to me, for I am young and slender, so wait a whiles for me. You'll be milking? and processing the milk, um, you also need to be actually actively herding the animals to whatever bit of grazing was appropriate nearby. Children were often used for herding, children as young as, as six. I think it would have been a nice mix of work and play. You did have responsibility. I mean, if your animal got into a, a bog or fell over a cliff or something like that, that was a serious problem. My sister Jeannie screeching at her nephews and nieces. Myra, the eldest, is down by looking after her newest, a douce and lithe wee baby. Her boys are growing sturdy and tall, though they're making a boo of herding the cows. I'll go help in a minute, once I've finished my daft wee poem. They were making cheese and butter, and then they would come back down to the cheese and butter to supply the village. But also they were storing the cheese and butter as a trading commodity. Yeah. We very often tend to think of the Highlands and Islands as having a subsistence and a marginal existence. But what, what we actually have is a combination between a subsistence and a commercial economy. And the cattle were absolutely fundamental to this commercial economy. Most of the cattle were being raised, yes, for dairy, but also for meat. And then they would be taken for sale down to places like Creef and Falkirk and then on to Carlisle and eventually down to London and, and elsewhere. And the money that is earned through this is an integral part of the commercial economy of the highlands and islands. So I think that's a really important element because it starts to shift our whole understanding of what the highlands and islands was like, particularly before uh, the clearances. The people who write about the highlands uh, coming from this perspective tend to be quite dismissive about the way that uh, farming was done. And they think that they've got a lot of better ideas coming in. But when we start looking at the amount of productivity that there was in the period before these criticisms came in, I think we get an indigenous perspective. We get the perspective um, of what was actually happening on the ground and that these places could be productive uh, and were productive and could support uh, a decent population. That's not to say that there weren't uh, years of hardship and of shortage and, and even of famine. There were, just as there were in England and in Lowland Scotland and indeed over all of Europe. Now, the highlands and the islands are more marginal. There is less of that really high quality land. But the people had created a farming system which by and large worked. At night, I lie in the sheiling lodge when everybody sleeps. I think I feel your body nudge upon my twamming breast. <laughs> I'll keep that we thought to myself. So if we take £1,400 of cheese mm -hmm. 
and that's just one year, you know, it mentions other ones. And we knock 400 pounds off. Right. Okay, so there's only a thousand pound of cheese. Yeah. So in September, that would be hard cheese. They'd be making crowdy as well, mm-hmm. butter. So they're feeding this lot here mm-hmm. the whole year long. So if there's a thousand pound of cheese, you've got the cow up there with her calf suckling. Mm-hmm. Now that wee cows only produce, we think, about six litres a, a day. Okay. Do you know a different? No, I don't. No? Okay. I keep asking people. No. We think about six litres a day, so the cow's going to soak half of that. Yeah. So for three litres of milk, how much cheese do you get? How much hard cheese do you get? This is the, this is the one we're at just now. Right. So we can get a ballpark figure for the cows that's here. Yeah. To complement and consolidate this amount of people. So the shillings are over the bucket there. So you're trying to calculate the number of cattle from the amount of alleged cheese. Yes. That's a brilliant idea. Yes. And I think that the documents that we have, which talk about the amount of dairy which was produced, and that doesn't even account for the number of beef cattle and barley and all the rest of it, uh, give an indication of um, how uh, viable that system of farming and uh, way of, of using the land was. A while's yet before summer's end, and we'll all be reunited. Then down to Johnny I will descend, and the both of us entwined. Certainly some of the accounts that come down to us, particularly through poetry and so on, uh, show that there was time for music and singing and socialising. And because the shillings were out from the village, so were other villages' shillings. And sometimes you would get contact with folks uh, who you're now living close by to, because you're out in the moor or up in the hill, where you might have been quite far away from them uh, during the winter time. So it was a way to maybe meet other people or reinforce your friendships with other people, possibly even to meet a romantic partner. There'd be talking, there'd be drinking, there'd be a bit of a party atmosphere. We know that there is elements of this because the Sheelands are quite often mentioned within the Kirk Session records for where instances of unholy fornication have taken place. So you can start to pick out what type of atmosphere was up there by the frequency of their mentioning within a more uh, kind of religious background and kind of discipline look. So these are the sort of things we we know that they're going to be milking the cattle, we know they're going to be making the cheese at this point. a wee bit later on, they'll also be distilling the whisky. Hapu chorum furuch na satcha and show. Ha upa rakam di hianu. I mustn't dally here longer. There's work to be done. I'll help with the cows. Then it's my turn to boil the tatties and make the broth. Then perhaps there'll be a wee bit kaley when the bairns have shut their eyes. Shall I sing them my song? <laughs> Never. I might be young, but I am not silly. My song, Johnny, is for you alone. Most ordinary folk didn't keep written records, so we don't have a huge amount of information uh, about the shillings. So what's especially important are Gaelic songs and stories which have been passed down. A smut of rain now. I feel it trickling down my shoulders. Like your fingers, Johnny, gently caressing. Fade me I am the rain, the mist, the linn. I am the shielding braid. I'll be running down to be with him, for I am Helen, Johnny's maid. In Hidden in Plain Sight, the experts were Duncan Mackenzie, Dr Elizabeth Ritchie and Siobhan Beetson. The writer was Chris Dolan and the actor Lisa MacDonald. Hidden in Plain Sight was produced by Adventurous Audio Limited and made possible thanks to the support of the Audio Content Fund.